Welcome to a special edition of Truth Talk. This will air midweek, and it is largely going to have uh, the content around it is to do with um, the Arab and Jewish war that is going on that is at now present drawing in all of the regional powers. I normally don't do podcasts like this, and I normally don't do podcasts dressed like this, and this is just all different and different timing and whatever it is. You probably noticed that the last one that I did, which aired on um, Monday, if you watched that and you weren't just listening, you saw that I was in my office. It was kind of an emergency recording that happened after a service, and Albeit, it just wasn't the drama around um, the war that made us record like that and do that. But I've also been kicked by a horse, which snapped my leg in half. And it's hard to get down here into the studio. Uh, Be that as it may, I made some uh, comments about uh, the case for Israel and Alan Dershowitz's book. And I weighed in pretty heavily on this point that uh, we are to uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we are not to get on the side of terrorism and thoughtless and mindless acts of violence. And as Christians, we oppose war in its totality, not just partially, but completely and one of the earmarks of the true Christian church, not the true Christian Catholic church, which has always been warmongers and enjoyed war and the atrocities committed by that faux Christian organization are myriad. But at no point anywhere has Pentecostals or apostolics, those associated with the apostles doctrine ever Uh, plugged in and associated themselves with a militant and warring faction. Now, there's two reasons why this is such a a hotbed in in, in its discussion, and that is um, that there there needs to be some understanding on both sides. So I first of all want to say that I do understand Um, why people are so emotionally charged. I do not understand why they're protesting in the streets in defense of either Israel or the Palestinians. Uh, Protest is grotesque and has proven for long uh, periods of time to be a uh, futile exercise in change of government. And so, anyhow... I made some statements which um, caused quite a bit of uh, an uproar in some people's uh, thoughts and minds about the side that I took and what I had said, and um, I had some uh, brief but in-depth conversations, brief though they may be, about my podcast on Monday, and I'll be frank with you, I got a good deal of pushback from it. And probably whatever uh, that podcast episode, small as it was, it was by far my most controversial one according to the pushback that I got. So I'm going to try to frame those statements. And I I said Monday when when that aired, that I would come back through the week and have time to extrapolate uh, some some meaningful content around it. Now, tragically, between the time that I recorded that and 48 hours later, there has been a massive bomb go off at the Arab hospital in Gaza, killing 500 people. And unfortunately, just as many in the region were preparing Uh, to have a summit and try to come to a peace agreement. 
Unfortunately, it was as um, President Joe Biden was lifting off an Air Force One to head over to try to negotiate some type of a peace. And so this is an unfortunate event. It's tragic, and it is the loss of innocent civilian life. And for that, we grieve and we side with them and we mourn with them and we weep with them that weep and we pray for them. And so by no means is I, am I a blinded Zionist and believe that just because Israel has a right to exist, that they have a right to wage war, commit war in any attempt way that they want. And so I, I need to explain and help people understand why you feel mixed emotions about this. And so I'm going to repeat myself to, uh, to a few of you that talk to me and, and poured your heart out about your conflicted feelings about my position and then what you're seeing, is number one, you have to be very wary of what you see and read on Instagram or on social media. It is not a viable platform for peer-reviewed and journalistic ethics in news. So it's, it's much like other things that I've said. If you read widely and varied, you will get a more balanced opinion. So for years, um, being involved in global missions and having... And I, I'll say this, I have by far more Arab friends and brothers in the Middle East than I do Jewish friends and brothers. Um, I do have some, but they're, they're few and far between. You know, they're, they're not, they're, they're by no means equal to the amount of friends I have that are in the Arab nations. And that being said, I, I, I have mixed emotions as well. Now, let me explain those mixed emotions and how someone should be reading or seeing this. First of all, um, you've got to you've got to be suspicious about social media, and here's why: you've heard me do uh, long form talks on this podcast before on truth, and I've told you that things can be true and not be the truth. And I use the illustration out of the book, Conversations About Truth, which is a long-form discussion and analyzation of journalistic ethics. If I hit this table right now, okay, I, I can hit it as hard as I, I can, okay? And Thomas McLeod, who's helping me produce this, he runs out in the small hall and says, shots were just fired in the studio. And someone turns around and immediately calls the police and someone else goes to the news and says it was reported to us by a live witness, uh, eyewitness that that Pastor Walker was in the in the podcast studio and a shot was fired. Now, that is true. It was reported to them by an eyewitness. It was they did see what you know, they they did say what that person said they saw. But that, that's not the truth. The truth is I hit the table as hard as I could. And so while when you're reporting, you are able to remove yourself one portion or one point away from the true emittance or expression of what happened, and you can start reporting what someone who is there said, and that becomes true while at the same time it is not the truth. Okay? And so... I, I encourage you. So for, for years, I've, I've done three things pretty faithfully. I read the Wall Street Journal five days a week. And, and I mean, I do other things faithfully, but just as it concerns the news. I read the Wall Street Journal five days a week. I read the Jerusalem Post, and I read the headlines of Al Jazeera. And the reason that I do that is because the, the Wall Street Journal is, is a, a reputable and dependable news source. And here's, here's where you, you have to learn to read a newspaper if, in case. Now, you, you think this is funny that I got to come on here and tell people how to read a newspaper. But a lot of people are not well read. A lot of people want to get their news in 10 seconds 
You know what I'm saying? And, and they get it off of a sound bite. They get it off of a clip of some newscast. And there is no journalistic peer review in it. It's people that are opining constantly, okay? But let me, let me in, you know, 30, 40 seconds, let me explain to you how and why to read a newspaper, okay? So I open the Wall Street Journal up every day. I, now that I live in Canada, I don't get it in, in paper anymore. I get it digitally. But I, I used to open it up when I lived in California every day. Paper, just you'd open it up, and there's the news. Headlines, what's news in the world, what's news in the U.S., what's news in the region, what's news in the financial sectors, what's news, and, you know, and it goes on and on and on. Now, I would read through that, and every single day in the Wall Street Journal, there's a small part, it could be on page two or five, you know, somewhere in there, and it's called Corrections and Retractions, and because they are a reputable news source, every single day they're correcting or they are retracting something that got said that they want to make sure that they're ethical and honorable about it. So they print it, and then, you know, it'll come out that, no, it wasn't 640,000 barrels of oil that spilled. It was 16,400, and you'll read in the, in the retractions and corrections, sorry, um, and this article on this day, this statement was made, we found that to be not true, or we found that to be a um, miscalculation, whatever it is. Or there will be this thing, look, we understand that this was reported to us and we had uh, bad, uh, bad sources and the sources were just trying to, you know, uh, stoke the fire. And so we retract the whole argument or the whole article. Man, that's, that's helpful to have. You name me one, one of your social media posts that ever does that. Name, is there one? They don't do that stuff, Okay. So that alone is the reason you need to be reading a newspaper instead of just watching uh, social media. Now, somebody says, okay, well, why don't, why don't you, why do you suspect uh, television newscasting and broadcast? Well, here, here's a great reason why. It, it, you'll move through the Wall Street Journal or the Jerusalem Post or whatever it is, and you'll go back another four or five pages, and you'll get to a part of the newspaper that's called opinions and editorials now would you you guys don't even read newspapers do you say he does that's why he's smart that's why he's here okay this is called op-eds what is an op-ed piece it is an opinion op is short for opinion or editorial which is short for editorial op-eds and what the op-eds are is the op-eds you get back there and it is, you know, so say we've had a reporter who's been living in Gaza for the last five years. He's been working on a major project, been doing some work with PBS and been doing some work putting together some documentary footage. He, he did. He's writing a book. He's investigating. He's being an investigative reporter. And, and this is his opinion about the thing. And so, man, that that reporter, or that guy will just opine, just lay his opinion out for for a long period of time. Now, they never go back in and offer retractions on that because it's it's his opinion. Well, what's interesting is when you're reading that, you're reading that through the lens of this is somebody's opinion. This is not true investigative journalism, okay? Well, when you're watching the news, they just put three or four people at a table and let them scream at each other for 20 minutes and call that news. And what you've just watched is a 30-minute segment of three or four people giving you an opinion, their opinions, over a long period of time. And it's more verbal sparring and whatnot. But again, there's not going to be this retraction of said contributor or pundit's position. That's his position. You know, you heard it. If you like it, line up with it. If you don't like it, then don't line up with it. Okay. So anyhow, then there's the editorials. The editorials are the guys that are sitting there in the corporate boardrooms of these news reporting and sources, and they say, look, here is our view. As an editorial board, as the editors of this newspaper, 
We want people to think and know that we stand in solidarity with this side or this position or this viewpoint. So a lot of times they'll take an editorial board and create a, a climate in which you can really like say, okay, so this newspaper is really right lean, leaning or it's left leaning. Now, that doesn't mean that tomorrow they're not going to report leftist things or right wing things. But what you can read in the, in the editorial section is this is the opinion of the editorial board. So that's called op-ed. You don't get that on television. You don't get that on nightly newscasts. You don't get that on, um, on social media. There's no corrections, no retractions. So let me say plainly, I am no fan of social media. I have it. I'm not, I don't preach against it. I have it. I use it to the degree that that horse will ride down the path for me, but it just doesn't get very far till it becomes more frustrating. Because what happens is, is like, for instance, we really do not know what happened in Gaza in the last 48 hours. Here's why we don't know. Immediately, Joe Biden and the whole staff, many of them in the region, all the cohorts, all of the entourages, all of the backroom guys, all of the policy advisors, they're all on airplanes headed right then there. They're, they're on their way. Boom, a bomb goes off. Okay, so the Wall Street Journal reports and it says that there is a hospital in which 500 innocent civilians are dead. Guys, I'm telling you, there is no way as a Christian, no way that that is a good thing. We grieve, we mourn and we empathize with those who are innocent and they suffer now. So somebody says, okay, so whoever shot that bomb, they're the monster. Not necessarily. Okay, you have to have a, a transcendent way of even thinking about this. So Israeli spokesman Daniel Hargary said in a briefing early Wednesday morning that no Israel strike, either by land, by air, or by sea, occurred near the hospital at the time of the deadly explosion. He said the Israeli military is publishing the radar information, footage, and recording of militants in Gaza assigning blame to Islamic Jihad, a group aligned with the Hamas. So Israel is repudiating the fact. Now, we honestly don't know that that's true. And we honestly don't know that it's Israel or, or Hamas. It could be a militant Islamic jihad group that's seeking to keep the region stoked, okay, and on full tilt. And so much so that the Palestinian ambassador of the United Nations accused Israel of carrying this strike out and lying about it. Now, what, what's of, of great interest to me is that Jordan and Amman and then begin to back out of the peace talks and the negotiations. This is exactly what a terrorist organization would want is a reason that is so inflammatory and that is so hostile to create more volatility in an already volatile situation. So let me explain to you that while the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, it, that letter is written to the Galatians. That is written to a New Testament church. That's not saying that there's not ethnicities and there's not, because in the next line it says there's neither male nor female. It's not saying that there's not man and woman anymore. What it's saying is when you come under the auspices of the church, you are neither an ethnic gathering group or you're, you're, you're not male nor female in that sense. There is a spiritual equilibrium that happens that you are aligning your core central compass with values that are from God and unifying and that are not connected to what you don't think anymore as well as a woman, this is what I want to believe, or as a man, this is what I think, or as a Jew or as a Gentile. It does, it's not the way it works in the church. So when you see these wars, these rumors of wars, this ought to be one of the greatest motivators for you to support Brother, um, brother uh, 
Yader or to support Brother um, um, Shepherd or to support the, the ministry in Lebanon. Why? Because the church is the only place where this war doesn't exist. Now outside the church, it's bad. There's sides being taken, and, and it's an awful deal. But inside the church, this is the greatest incentive for evangelism, is that we have the antidote. We have the answer. We have the way forward. Pray. Pray that our missionaries are safe. Pray that our churches are successful. Pray that our altars are full, that the waters of baptism are troubled all over the Middle East, because that is the only answer in this last day. Okay, so that being said, okay, the church is the antidote, but the church doesn't go out into the political dramas and into the the construct of the world and try to achieve social justice through that. We don't believe in a social justice gospel. We believe in a spiritual gospel that will ultimately spiritualize your social interactions, and that's the social equilibrium we need. Okay, now. That being said, why do I have mixed emotions about this? And as a modern, educated person, you're able to hold two opposing thoughts in balance together without them becoming self-destructive or self-defeating, right? And so what you're able to do is see that this is, an, this is an atrocity, okay? So, and I said this, and I'll, I want to repeat this. Babies, innocent babies have died in this conflict, okay? And the reason that innocent babies have died on both sides, from both sides, is for two different reasons and two different applications, okay? So Hamas takes these children and kills them, holds them hostage, uses them as human shields, uh, behead some, okay? Now, that's been confirmed. It, it was confirmed and publicly announced by both the U.S. president and both and his teams and the United Nations that, yes, we know that Hamas has beheaded children. And so, bam, that went off like a nuclear time bomb, and the world was just like, oh, what? Okay, now... There have been hundreds that have died now, okay, based on this. There's been thousands that have died based on other accounts. Has Israel killed innocent children? Absolutely. It's called collateral damage. When you send a bomb in that big and you send an incendiary device and an explosive that has that much firepower behind it, there is no way to get it so strategic and so pinpointed that you cannot have collateral damage. You fire a bomb that big and there's innocence. That, that's why war is never an answer, okay? Now, that is why you're emotional. I see those babies. I see those children on the Palestinian side. My heart breaks. I grieve for them. But I'm also able to hold in balance and tension the difference between innocent children that have been killed due to the nature of Israel firing bombs and the difference between children being killed by terrorist Hamas organization killing them individually and arbitrarily. Okay? So let's back up. The fruit of this is innocent lives is being lost in this war, and that is tragic, and you should mourn it. The root of it is you got to ask this question. How in the world did this start? Well, we know how it started. A couple Saturdays ago, Hamas wakes the world up and just bombs the thunder out of Israel. Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. And by the way, let me make mention of this. Tel Aviv is the most secular city in the world, the most pro-homosexual, the most atheistic city. And you just have people there. They're, they're Israelites. They're Jews. They do, but they're not religious. Why are you bombing them? Why isn't the world aghast at that? They, they're not involved. They're not the capital. They don't, they're not the ones that are dropping the bombs. But you go down here, Hamas loads up, bombs 500 bombs. Israel starts shooting back. 
Yes, the minute Israel shoots back, more people's going to die, more innocent lives, more babies, more innocent moms, more innocent women, more innocent men, obviously, are going to die. Why? Firepower is bigger, okay? That is the fruit of war. It's called collateral damage. It's reprehensible. It's to be repudiated. It's to be prayed about and against by a Christian concept and mindset. But it is not the same as a terrorist organization taking eight babies over there and beheading them or coming into a music concert and abducting and holding people hostage and destroying them. It's just not the same. You're, you're, t- you're not talking about apples and and apples you're talking about apples and oranges it's something different so the fruit of it is innocent lives lost yes we weep yes we pray but what is the root cause of those innocent lives being lost hold that in a different place in your mind and thought and that is hey stupids whoever voted these idiots in that thinks that hamas is a democratic elected government that is useful on the world stage stop voting in terrorists the the bible's right and we're wrong it says you sow that you're going to reap god is not mocked whatsoever man sows that shall he reap you live by the sword you what jesus say what you die by the sword so you can't say that you poke a bear in the eye and you incite a riot and then go over there and sit down and say, oh, goodness gracious, look at, huh, what are they doing to us? Yes, there's going to be collateral damage. Okay, so one of three things happen here with this hospital. Number one, Hamas's rockets went awry and they accidentally shot up something they didn't intend to shoot up. Number two, um, Islamic Jihad, a group that is allied with Hamas, intentionally set it up and did it so that it would bring a speedy halt to the peace talks or the negotiations that were getting ready to happen. Or number three, hear me, number three, technology is not perfect. Israel could have fired a bomb, misguided, misaligned, it, technology could have glitched and it would be one of the worst and most tragic and epic mistakes in modern war in history. And yes, we think it's reprehensible that anyone anywhere would bomb a hospital. That's against the Geneva Code. That, that's not justifiable in any way, shape, or form. But before you run to social media and say, yep, this is what happened, back up and think. Even if, let's say it is Israel, let's say they did send a bomb to a certain strategic place and somehow it missed and, and, and smashed in to a hospital or the other one is where the UN workers were holding several hundreds, if not thousand uh, refugees. It, it can happen, folks. I mean, there's days our cars don't run right. There's days that the planes have a glitch in them and you can't take off. And so... There's all kinds of scenarios in which this could be some horrible accident. But what you have to do is keep intention and polarity, the fruit of it, we weep for all sides. But just because there's children dying on both sides and innocent dying on both sides does not mean that both sides are as evil. Folks, there's not one place in history, I'm going to repeat it again, where ever, ever the Israeli government ever lined up a Palestinian kid and beheaded him or killed him. That just doesn't ha- uh, Yes, they've shot bombs and innocents have died. That's why you don't shoot bombs at a world superpower. You think America, you think Britain, you think any of these other countries would tolerate that? Absolutely not. Okay. And so keep in tension the difference between root and fruit. Cry equally over the fruit and the innocent that are dying. But always remember, would this be happening had Hamas not fired all those 500 rockets on Israel? Would this be happening? And the answer is no. Because at no time did Israel just wake up and arbitrarily say, you know, We don't have anything to do this Saturday morning. Let's just bomb the thunder out of them, right? And granted, guys, the casualty is going to be so skewed. 
right? I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but I've been to Israel several times. They got this thing called the Iron Dome. You shoot 500 rockets and only 103 of them actually landed. So therefore, the casualty rate's going to be down. But Israel says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, they're kind of the Old Testament type people. And so you got to watch out fighting with that kind of thing. And okay, you fire 500 at us, we're sending 500 back. Well, the only problem is the first salvo was we had an iron dome that, you know, got, you know, 397 of them out of the air and, or they exploded up there with, you know, minimal damage. But when the 500 go back because it's eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, there's no iron dome down there in Gaza. It's all rain and cats and dogs down there. And so the reality is, is that the, the, the casualty rate is disproportionate. I get that. But it doesn't make Israel this terroristic insane thing that just wakes up and explodes on the whole region. But your Bible did say that the whole world would turn against Israel. And we are sitting here watching wars and rumors of wars. Notice that sentence together. Not only are we watching a war, but every single day in one of the eight different periodicals that I read, okay, there has been a majority of them saying Syria is escalating. The region is destabilizing. There's liquidity in the accords. There is, there, there is, um, th there's vacillation in, in commitments between, oh, Hezbollah and Lebanon are moving in rockets. Oh, uh, they're on the northern tip of Israel. They're now setting up tanks aiming at, at uh, Lebanon. Will this destabilize the region? Shall the region, Iran's getting involved. De-escalation is needed, but we're more worried about, notice this, we're watching a war, but every single day, what else is lurking? A shadow over us, the rumor of war. This is a war that is every day living with the rumor of war. That is why we need to pray for the salvation of, of the Palestinian people. Every Arab needs to repent of their sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enter into the new kingdom as new creation. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female come into the church. The water's warm, and the prevailing zeitgeist is Christ and the Spirit of God. But if you're going to stay out there, we pray that every Arab would come into the church and we pray that every Jew would repent and come into the church. Okay. But we also, from an eschatological point of view, the Bible clearly tells you, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so while you watch this war and rumor of wars, try to keep the first cause. What started this doesn't make the fruit of it right doesn't make the fruit of it less painful. The fruit is the fruit, and we cry for everybody. We pray for them all. But the root is not equal. Israel was provoked in this. Israel was attacked in this. Okay? The root cause of this whole dilemma is a couple Saturday mornings ago, Hamas woke the world up by raining bombs down on Israel. That's the root. And you, every Palestinian, every pro-Palestinian, every Palestinian sympathizer and empathizer needs to ask the question, would this innocent life be lost? Would this tragic thing that I just watched right here on social media, would that have happened had they, Hamas, not fired them bombs on Israel? And the answer to that is no. Therefore, you have to see a difference in blame and a difference in responsibility in the root. Now, once it becomes the fruit of war, we pray for everybody. We pray for all sides and all parties. And you're a wise and modern and intellectual people, and you can hold those two thoughts in balance and tension. Please, be in prayer for us. Be in prayer for each other, that we do everything we can to win the lost, Arab or Jew. Pray for the Palestinians that they see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And please 
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs>